So this is Matthew chapter 21, the scripture for August 21st. We just discussed the triumphal entry a couple times before in Mark 11 and in Luke 19, both the videos to which are, are, are linked below. And Matthew's retelling of this triumphal entry focuses on Jesus' fulfillment of prophecy and Jesus being understood as a prophet in and among the crowds. So as mentioned in the Mark 11 video, Jesus riding on a colt signifies a king returning uh, from, from, from conquering, returning from, from, to his capital. It doesn't represent a conqueror. Jesus does not see Jerusalem as a foreign nation needing to be taken over. That would be signified with a stallion, which Jesus does not do. So Jerusalem, as Jesus' capital, seems to be understood, at least in Jesus' mind, as sort of a fait accompli. This has already been done. That even if Jerusalem doesn't understand at this point that it is the capital of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, uh, it, it is, uh, whether or not they know it. Now, one of my favorite bands is Jars of Clay. Uh, they wrote a song in 2003 called Jealous Kind. Uh, it's about the love that's willing to walk into a temple, a holy place, a place that, that is thought of as a place of peace, and flip tables over in order to get the attention of people who've, who've, who've run away from you. It's for the sake of preserving a relationship. Is that something you would do? What kind of relationship would you have to have? Uh, I've linked this song, Jealous Kind, uh, below. It's worth a listen. Um, it's about four minutes. I, I would definitely listen to it. Um, it's very good. So in, in place of profiteering money changers, Jesus held court in the temple, healing and teaching uh, throughout the course of the day before he and his disciples retreated to Bethany, uh, which, as we learn in the Gospel of John, is the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They're not mentioned uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, however. On his way back into Jerusalem the next day, there's a strange interaction he has with this fig tree. Uh, this fig tree looks super healthy on the outside, very leafy, like it's probably going to have some tasty figs in it. And Jesus starts combing through the leaves and doesn't see anything. And he gets angry at the fig tree, curses it, and it immediately withers. This type of, of fig tree, one that looks nice on the outside but produces no fruit, this is similar to the Jewish temple and to the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Their lack of fruit reveals their internal dysfunction. Uh, and it's going to be something that Jesus will really lambast them on in a couple of chapters. Uh, this has been the focus of a number of things Jesus has said. It's not about the optics of a situation. It's about the reality of a situation. Don't be so concerned with what you look like. Be concerned about what you do. Uh, if the fig tree had looked really bad but had good figs, I think Jesus would have been okay with that. Now, the temple of authorities today are ready for Jesus' shenanigans. They, they must have learned from yesterday that you don't just leave Jesus unwatched as he goes through the temple. Uh, so they challenge his authority right off the bat. But Jesus responds to them in a crafty manner, knowing that if they recognize John's authority, that they would need to recognize Jesus' authority because John uh, attested to Jesus. John would serve as one of the two to three witnesses necessary for Jesus to, to have a case, for Jesus to, to be considered a credible authority. Um, now, the religious leaders are like, well, so we can't allow for John to have authority, because that gives Jesus authority. But we can't say John doesn't have authority, because the crowds really like John. So they answer Jesus, and instead of answering what they believe, they answer in a way that preserves, so they think, their authority. They say, mm, we don't know. And I think that that's, that ambivalent response, it provokes Jesus' condemnation of their two-facedness. Everybody knew that John had authority. And the leaders of the temple simply don't like what acknowledging that authority would do to their power. So the parable of the wicked tenants is what Jesus then tells them. And we discussed this briefly in Luke chapter 20. I've linked that also below. There's a number of links below. So if you need to come through them, uh, you go for it. Uh, in this parable, which actually functions more like an allegory, where there's more of like a one-to-one, -one, you could say that the tenants are the religious leaders. You could say that, you know, the the, the prophets uh, can be identified with the servants that the landowner understands. Uh, most parables aren't allegorical. They're not one-to-one. -one. But in this parable that functions more like an allegory, Jesus shows what the practice of Israel has been and what the pattern looks like throughout history of how the tenants, in this case the Israelites, welcome or don't welcome God's messengers, God's prophets. 
What the pattern looks like going forward is that they're going to kill the son, who Jesus identifies as himself. He also foretells the destruction of Jerusalem in verse 41 as a consequence of the tenant's behavior. Instead of a fig tree that looks good and leafy, God wants the people of the kingdom to bear fruit regardless of what they look like. Now I wonder, how similar to you are God's love and God's rage? That's all for Matthew chapter 21. Tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, excuse me, Monday, the 24th, we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 22. May God bless you in your reading of scripture.